Please be seated. And what a pleasure it is to be here on this occasion, the occasion of many confirmations and to see all of your faces here in this, this really wonderful space. They left their nets immediately, left their boat, left their father, left their community immediately and followed him. So says our passage from Matthew. There are moments in our lives when something crystallizes and we take immediate action. A college student, after years of preparation for one vocation, realizes in a flash that she wants to do something entirely different with her life. May have happened to you. A man, after years of dating, a woman realizes in a moment that he's ready to pop the question. A person with an addiction, after years of suffering, sometimes known to people, sometimes unknown to people, realizes all at once that it's time to get help. There are moments in our lives when something crystallizes and we take immediate action. But in all of the examples I just mentioned, I at least hinted or said directly something that was leading up to that moment of crystallization and action. Something prepares the way, whether that's a kind of long experience, a time of reflection, or some powerful feeling. Something leads up to this immediately taking a new direction. Which is, of course, why it's befuddling and challenging to hear the story of the call of Peter and Andrew and James and John in our gospel for today, in Matthew's account. For their moment of crystallization and immediate action seems to come, seems to come with no preparation whatsoever, and the immediate action they take seems to mean that they abandon everything else, jobs, family. Remember, it says he left his, they left their father, their family, and their communities in the process. So without any warning, Jesus says, follow me, and off they go. Is this what following Jesus is all about for us? Is it about a sudden redirection and a sudden abandonment of everyone and everything we've known? To get at this question, I think it's important first to just understand a little more about two things. One, what it was like to be a fisherman in these days, then what it was like to be a disciple. These might help us understand a little better what's going on. First, what was the life of a fisherman all about? Now, we've seen all the movies, haven't we? <laughs> we've seen depictions of this in the various biblical movies, uh, and, and they're not, not far off, actually. For this, of course, was the job that Pe in this story that Peter and Andrew and James and John were leaving, were putting behind them. This was the job they decided to let go of in response to Jesus' invitation to follow him. So what we know about fishermen in ancient times, some of what we know is this. Fishermen might have had some money, some economic resources, but their social position in the grand scheme of things was very low. It was about as low as shepherds. <laughs> some writers of the time, in fact, ranked fishermen as they kind of went through the social order. Fishermen were at the very bottom of that social order meaning that at the time they would have been regarded by others as ne'er-do-wells, you know, they couldn't do anything else, as ruffians because of the kind of life they led, and in some cases as thieves. They were not to be trusted just like shepherds. Shepherds were spoken of the same way. But in addition to this, and this is a really important point, fishermen were people whom the rich or whom the richer often took advantage of. Many fishermen were not free to take home most of the money or the fish, they were paid in both, that they earned in their, in their jobs, in that they often leased their fishing rights from others who took a percentage off the top. This percentage could be as high as 40%. Think of that. 40% of what you catch or what you sell belonged to somebody else who held the lease. 
All this is to say that the lives that Peter and Andrew and James and John left were in many ways lives worth leaving. Lives worth leaving. I don't know if you've ever had a time where you were at the bottom, you were in a job that was the bottom of the social ladder. I cleaned rooms for a while as a young woman. I felt, maybe I wasn't at the bottom of the social ladder, but it sure felt that way by the way I was kind of seen or not seen. So uh, they were lives kind of worth leaving. They were often held in suspicion of others, by others. They were routinely taken advantage of by others who compared to them at least were rich. So that's the plight of these people who Jesus came to and said, follow me. So if this is the plight of Peter and Andrew and James and John, the thing they were leaving behind, what was the life they were saying yes to in becoming disciples and followers of Jesus? Or what can we learn about that in that they would have regarded Jesus as a teacher, as a rabbi, one of the many rabbis of the times at this point in the narrative. Again, to go back, in first century Judaism, becoming a disciple or a follower of a rabbi was not something that happened like that. You started doing it and you started aspiring to do that as a child with very lengthy study of the Torah and memorization of the same. Ancient people memorized things that we could never even imagine memorizing. This study then went on for years into adolescence and into young adulthood and into adulthood, culminating in a period of intense questioning and testing by the rabbi himself, after which the person would either be rejected by the rabbi or would be greeted with the rabbi, finally saying the words that Jesus says to this group, the rabbi saying, follow me, but only after the person proved they were worthy. It was then and only then that the follower would be admitted to the circle of people who were called the rabbi's disciples, who embraced the rabbi's teachings and who attempted to live as the rabbi lived. All this is to say that Jesus, taking the initiative in this story, as he did toward Peter and Andrew and James and John, would have been shocking. Shocking because fishermen such as these would have had no preparation to be accepted as potential followers of any rabbi, and because in our story, it's Jesus, not the would-be disciples, who take the initiative. So you see some of these, this background material and how it suffuses this story in a way that we wouldn't necessarily know. And so for me, as I, as I take that in, part of what this story says about following Jesus is that Jesus does not look for followers among those with social status, among those who are somehow perfect, or among those who are well prepared. Instead, Jesus calls the lowly, and in doing so, calls into question the system that keeps people down low. Jesus calls the imperfect, and in doing so, calls into question the notion that God expects us to be perfect as followers. Jesus calls those who are unprepared, and in doing so, calls into question the whole thing that you have to be completely prepared to act in any faithful way, that you have to be completely prepared. Jesus calls those who, in fact, who are stuck in some part of their lives, who don't have any good prospects, and don't have a way necessarily out of their unpromising circumstances. In our story, Jesus calls these as followers, not sometime in the future when they'll be more perfect, when they'll be more prepared, when they will have worked their way out of their difficult circumstance. No, Jesus calls them now, asking them in that, and I'm not even sure they know what they're saying yes to, asking them to come into a different understanding of their worth, what they're worthy of, and to act out of a new understanding of their worth and of other people's worth, of other people's worth. And while it would be easy to think that our gospel story is telling us that to follow Jesus means that we have to leave everything and everyone behind, some of us might want to do that, 
I believe the deeper message of the story for us is this. We do not have to leave home and family and job and community behind to follow Jesus. We have to live in that home, live with that family in many cases, function in that job and be in that community with a new self-understanding of our worth and with a new appreciation for the worth of others. Not always easy. We have to embrace our identity over and over again as the baptized, as people who have died already and been reborn in Christ, people who have put on the worth and dignity of the children of God and have taken up a life of intentional relationship with those who sit right next to us, who are worthy, with those in our community who are worthy, with those who live far away who are worthy, with those who are like us who are worthy, and those who are unlike us who are worthy, with creation itself that is worthy. Creation is worthy. We have to put on the dignity and worth of the children of God and extend the same respect and dignity to the whole of creation. It really sounds, it's, it's such an insight of uh, indigenous people, is it not? I wore this today thinking of that. Thinking of, of the gift of our relationships with indigenous people and their belief and enactment of the respect and dignity that is due all of creation. All of this, of course, brings us to today, a day when we're confirming 19 people, unless somebody has just opted out <laughs> uh, just recently, 19 people here at St. George's, which is some kind of record. I don't know what record it is, but it's probably some kind of record, certainly for this parish, maybe in the diocese. I have not checked that out, but it, it, regardless of record or not, it's something to be thankful for and to be amazed at, actually. <laughs> Our compromands today are not presenting themselves. They better not be presenting themselves as perfect or as completely prepared or anything like that. After the confirmation, they're not intending, I don't think, to abandon their homes, their families, their jobs, or their communities. Some people do receive a call that way, not, not most of us. Rather, as they affirm their baptismal vows, and they will in this liturgy, they're committing to doing their best to live the life they have already been living with a renewed self-understanding of their dignity and worth and a renewed intention to extend that in some way to others, to treat others, as our covenant says, with respect and dignity, to work for justice and peace, to be good news rather than bad news in their lives, to protect the earth, to support each other in their life together. So David was telling me about our front lines over there where people have placed where they are on a Monday after they leave here on a Sunday, where, where they, their front lines of their Christian faith are. So our, Beb, our confirmation candidates are saying, that's what we're going to take to those places. And, this, and the, some of the support we'll have are your life groups that help you reflect more on the way in which Sunday infuses what you do on Monday. But of course, our confirmands don't have to do this alone. For all of us are participating in this confirmation. All of us have a chance to recommit ourselves to following Jesus by kind of taking a page out of Peter and Andrew and James and John's book imaginatively. We have a chance to imagine ourselves in the middle of some of the things we do all the time, Monday through Sunday. Imagine ourselves at work. Imagine ourselves parenting or being a spouse or a friend. Imagine ourselves in the community. We have the chance to imagine what we're in the middle of in any of those things when all at once the Lord of life surprises us and invites us, takes the initiative, invites us to follow him right then and there. We have a chance to imagine the difference it might mean to us to say yes to that invitation and to make our way in a different way, in the way, in the roles we already have. 
in the way we parent or act as a spouse or a friend, in the way we live or move in the community, in the way we work. Today know this, the Lord of life is here and is calling us all, not just the confirmands, not just the children, not just the clergy. Today know this, the Lord of life is here and is calling us all. We do not need to be perfect. You do not need to be perfect. We do not need to be more prepared. We do not even need to be socially acceptable. All we need to be is hungry for a world of greater respect and dignity and willing to do our part as the baptized to bring that world into being, all with God's help. So let today be the day that something crystallizes for you, that you're given a new self-understanding of your dignity and worth, and that you're inspired to bring that very spirit to the world. Let today be a new day in which you choose, not even knowing what it means, to follow him. <laughs>